Good afternoon, everybody. And I'm going to do my best to look this way and to look this way uh, during the presentation. I still have goosebumps from the, the Rise Award. So that was such a beautiful, beautiful presentation and, and well deserved. You know, I've, I've really enjoyed my collaboration with the School of Medicine over the, the last 17 years. Actually, enjoyed also that I was in the Stanford healthcare system dealing with some personal issues over the last five years. So that it's been a good collaboration um, in all respects. And I think what I've learned over the time that I've been here is the importance of having foundational principles um, that were set forth by Governor Stanford and his design team. Um, a key component of the team, Frederick Law Olmsted, is someone we're going to talk about a bit today in our presentation. And it's going to be a little bit of a journey. Um, I, I sometimes call this a roller coaster ride because it's a lot of slides, um, very few words. Uh, but what it will do is ho hopefully give you the confidence that we have an intentional plan for um, maintaining and enhancing the, the university character as well as cultivating a vibrant culture and community. Uh, so it's been mentioned a few times a day that, you know, and I also get it in my ear all the time from alumni, you know, what, why does the university campus have to change so much all the time? I liked it the way it was when I was here. And this quote is actually quite, quite precious. Um, in 20 years, when you escort your youngster up Palm Drive to his freshman year at Stanford, will the farm look very different to you? Well, nobody knows, says Oscar Nelson, Stanford's master planner. Not only are there no definite plans for new academic buildings for the next couple of decades, next couple of decades, there aren't even many places left to put them. So I chuckled when I read this. Um, this is a quote from 1976. This is 45 years ago or more. Uh, and you all know, we have definitely built buildings. We definitely have plans for new buildings. Uh, and we do have places yet to put them. And a big part of the role of what I do is make sure we put buildings in the right place and to make sure that they enhance the campus and its character. And our students are our strength. Um, I'm proud to be part of a university that has one of the most diverse populations um, of any university out there. We've heard a lot about diversity today. Um, and I just want to give you the, the, the comfort that we're doing this on the main campus as well. There are a lot of programs, a lot of aspirations, um, and we're working hard. Um, and, and even the support of our students economically is something I'm going to start to thread throughout this presentation. Um, thoughts from Frederick Law Olmsted that aren't just about planning. And one of the thoughts that he had is that in his day, landscapes were really for the rich people. The rich people got to go in their backyards or their estates, uh, but he really wanted to design for the masses. And I think that was really important. Central Park, for example, was for everybody. And I think for us, the campus is still open. It's still used by the local communities. It's still used by anybody that wants to come here. I think to my knowledge, the only time it's been closed was the last two years during the pandemic. And, and we were, we're over that uh, closure at least. But diversity is our strength, as we've talked earlier today. I, I love, I saw this on, on Dean and Miner's slide as well. The upper left image is of the building we're sitting in today. And the fact that the School of Medicine is really daylighting this as such an important issue really mirrors uh, the commitment of the university as a whole. So what I want to do is, is loosely structure this based on campus planning principles i'm going to talk a little bit about the olmsted plan uh, how we infuse arts and culture into what we do talk a little bit about our sustainability future so first a little bit about the plan um, I, I don't know how many people know this but you know when when governor stanford went to frederick law olmsted and said i want you to design a master plan for the university the first place he put it was up in the foothills and so he envisioned a, a very pastoral, bucolic, uh, winding roads and pathways, less formal organization. And he took the train to show uh, Governor Stanford. And he said, nope, you're not putting it there. I want it down on the plain where my son rides his horse. And I want a monumental entrance. So the bottom right image is the next scheme that Fred uh, Olmsted came up with, and that's coming down Palm Drive. But you can see there's 
still a vista maintained to the foothills, the church was to the right. Again, Governor Stanford said, you know, um, you're going to put the church right at the end of the axis. And that's where it ended up. Um, and so this interesting tension between Stanford and Olmsted played out, I think, throughout that whole process. We'll talk a little bit about that later. So we did end up with a campus master plan. Most of my colleagues around the country that are university architects are so excited that, uh, or actually they're envious that we have a, a master plan from day one. It was brilliant in its conception of expandability, um, the idea of the east-west quadrangles, the framework of malls and axes. Uh, but, you know, um, as many times it happens, we kind of ignored it in the 1900s and we found ourselves at a place where instead of having a, a beautiful framework of, of, of these axes you see in the middle image, um, we blocked some of the axes, we didn't support some of the axes, and the, the university trustees committed back in 1991 to revisit the plan. It was a second century plan. Um, to go back to the original concepts of Olmsted. The circle is Campus Drive because, of course, um, in Olmsted's day, the car wasn't all that important. And here is where the School of Medicine sits in relationship to that diagram. And so we have restored uh, arterials like Jane Stanford Way into a really wonderful bike ped. We're finishing the last section of it in front of the business school as we speak. Uh, LaSuain Mall used to be for vehicles, cars, trolleys, um, that has been transformed into a bike ped path system. And this, this was something that we came across. Uh, Olmsted knew the power of the circle to help reconcile all these different streets and paths coming in different directions. And we were looking at this plan and saying, wow, that, that looks really similar to what we're doing with our roundabout systems. And he, in fact, we put him almost the same place that he had put him in his master plan. These have proven to uh, move vehicles through at a much better pace, of course, but also they've been much safer and they've also created a much more aesthetic pleasing journey around campus drive. So the quadrangle system, though, I think is what everybody remembers. Frank Law Olmsted, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted. This, our main quad, of course, has always been our architectural heart of campus. Um, but it's also our spiritual heart. It's where we have events, celebrations, ceremony, um, and even free speech. Uh, in the wake of the George Floyd um, death, this was uh, an exhibit that was just generated by the students, uh, unfortunately, during the pandemic but it really expresses in the most important place on campus the importance of what happened. Um, I also get, why can't everything look like the main quad? Why can't you just design buildings? Everybody loves the main quad. And you know, our, our mantra really is to design buildings of their era. If you start in the upper left-hand corner of this slide and go down each of the columns and you end in the bottom right-hand corner, you can sort of see the progression but I look at the university buildings as, as like a family. You know, you have your, your parents, um, you have that quirky uncle that might look a little bit different, but he's still part of your family or the, or the cousins or the kids. Um, and it's really the palette, it's the scale, um, it's the quality of design that, that keeps the campus together. It's not necessarily the style. And, and you know, Olmsted actually, <laughs> He coined a phrase for this, it's called elegance of design, where the composition is more important than the individual pieces. Uh, and I think that's true with our campus. It's true with our campus landscape and its placemaking. We try really hard to provide a variety of different types of places from very contemplative to very active spaces for recreation, places like you see in the bottom left-hand corner, just to act out. So let's look at this quadrangle um, system a little more closely. Um, we have the Gerhardt Casper Quad, which is part of the old Manzanita. It was formerly called Manzanita Complex. We do have a future quadrangle that we think we could implement that would be anchored by Toyon Hall and Encina Commons if we ever reimagine Crothers. But the catalyst, the catalyst for really adhering to this plan is the science and engineering quad you see in blue. 
And this is a view of the Science and Engineering Quad back in 1991. Some of the best research in science ever at Stanford happened here, the first linear accelerator, uh, the laser. But they were one and two story, many sort of concrete block masonry buildings. There was no there there. Um, there, there was a little, you see the green um, garden space there was built a little later that really didn't help. Um, and so we took this site and built the science and engineering quad and a couple of positive things out of this. So four times the amount of square feet in the same site, we end up with cutting edge research buildings, very flexible buildings that could be repurposed for decades. But we also ended up with that grand quad. So whereas the previous you know, um, site plan had really no heart. This one now has a heart. And we've been continually layering different uses, um, whether or not as places for gathering, for events, for just sitting on the lawn, uh, bringing food trucks in, cafes. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to go there recently, this is uh, a new piece of art that has been installed. It's Pars uh, Pro Toto by Alyssa Quada. And it really is, it's 12 stone spheres sourced from all over, different sizes, and it really is an incredible intervention into this space, which was hard, we were, we were studying, can you just put one little sculpture in the corner? And, and no, it's not gonna really do it. And what I love about art is you can interpret it in so many different ways. And while our geologist, geologist department uses this for academic purposes as well, I like to look at it as representing the diversity of our campus population. We come in all different sizes, colors, from all over uh, all parts of the world. We heard earlier from Dean Miner the importance of linking all the different parts and pieces of research and academia. Um, this is not a new idea. Um, communi I can't even say this word. Communitiveness is a word that Olmsted coined, and this was the first inner quad. And you can see all different disciplines and in his mind, the arcades, the central space, allowed those in chemistry to mix with those in civil engineering, to mix with those in physics. Not a new idea, but we like to think everything's a new idea. And so our connections from engineering to medicine, to basic science, to data science, to even our new school focused on climate sustainability um, is really important. My role is to make sure it's easy to move around so a researcher can go from building A to building D very easily. In retrospect and pre uh, preparation for today, I thought it'd be interesting to think back just to 2000, how many new buildings are a part of this family of School of Medicine um, facilities and every red dot is a new building since 2000 um, and the two white dots are the two hospitals. I, I, I was just sort of floored when I really look at, looked at this closely, uh, but it shows the change that has happened um, to the school. And when I got here 2005, um, got my feet wet. Uh, we were working on a few things, and I remember getting called into the office of the dean. And if you knew Dean Pizzo, he, you know David. Um, we need we need some help. You know we've got one of every kind of architecture. There is no front door. There is no communal hub. Um, there is no sense of identity for the school of medicine. Um, the front of our our school is a parking lot. What what can you do to help? And so we. We worked on a master plan, um, and that's the, where the conception of Discovery Walk came into play, is the spine that could tie all that together. Uh, the Clark Center had just been completed, and we said, why don't we use it as a sort of foundation to develop an architectural kit of parts, so limestone, some copper red accents, uh, typical ways to do window systems, and start to translate that throughout the rest of the campus. So in 2008, um, many of you may remember this was the front door of the School of Medicine. If I was a prospective student or faculty uh, member from Harvard that wanted to switch, this is where I would go. And I would knock on that hollow metal brown door. I, I couldn't do it in this picture because it says wet paint, but it was typically locked. 
it was typical, typically locked, and sometimes I didn't even know if the uh, intercom system worked all that well, but it, not the best impression. Um, next year, this was the front door of the School of Medicine, the building that you sit in today, and it really has served an incredible purpose. Fourth floor is for students only. I can't even get up to the fourth floor myself. Uh, Jennifer can't either. Um, the lower level simulation, which is just an incredible place to, to learn all the techniques. Uh, as a med student, uh, we have convening like we're doing today, the dean's office. It's a really symbolic front door for the university. And the bold overhead um, canopy really wanted to make a statement. It's not the largest building by far in the School of Medicine, but it perhaps might be the boldest. Uh, at the same, same time, we were working on the stem cell building, a low-case stem cell building. And again, you can see that same architectural kit of parts translated a little different way. We didn't want to come out with all these carbon copies. So we do have limestone. We have a significant copper red element at the entrance, uh, same ways that we make window systems, uh, but it meant to complement. But I think perhaps the biggest change was the transformation of what, this was the face to our main campus, right? It was a parking lot. It was a service lane. You don't see a lot of people here. Uh, and then with Discovery Walk, it's become this animated connective device that you know you can see a colleague we saw in, in some of the videos. Uh, this is where you can mentor a student. Uh, this is where you can have an exercise class with your scrubs on. This is where you can also see the highlights and milestones of the School of Medicine in the planters. Um, it's a really great way to connect the School of Medicine, but it also serves to connect the School of Medicine to the adjacent areas we'll talk about in a moment. Now, this is sort of a, a little um, consolidated region here for the School of Medicine, but we also have buildings elsewhere. And when we started to look on Welch Road, I remember the discussion, it's important that that same kit of parts helps the School of Medicine to have an identity there. So this is the Friedenrich Center. Uh, for translational research, as well as uh, the Wang building, the Wang building. And, you know, most people could look at these two buildings and say, yeah, they belong to that family of School of Medicine. Um, they're not all exact, but I get it. There's terracotta cladding, limestone cladding, um, in this case, an overhead lid. All along the way, we were designing the hospital at the time, um, opened in 2019. I love the image in the upper left you may have seen. It's the first patient being rolled across the bridge to transfer from old hospital to new hospital. Great art program. Uh, and then the children's hospital opened up a little bit before that. I think this is an exemplar for the world for how do you create an interiors that tells a story that is comfortable for not only sick children, but the sick children's siblings and their families and their parents who have to be there day in, day out. Um, it's an incredibly inspiring place. School of Medicine has to connect to the medical center. Um, it does programmatically, of course, with our physicians and faculty, but it also does architecturally. So BMI1 is Biomedical Innovations Building opened in um, 2019. And this quote from, from Dean Minor really talks about the fact this is a mixing bowl, almost in a different way that the Clark Center is, um, but it brings together all different types of researchers. I like to think of this building architecturally as the building that sort of helps the School of Medicine architecture meld in with the hospital architecture. And if, you, if any of you know CCSR, it's the building that palette-wise was a little bit different. It was a little shinier and more alumin, aluminum, stainless steel. Um, this building helps to make that building's architecture more relevant by uh, picking up on the trellis you see in the upper left-hand corner. Um, but it also then, the new building, goes back to our kit of parts of limestone and terracotta. So it, it made it a lot more whole. Um, and unfortunately, I think it, it was completed right before shelter in place. So you sort of just, <laughs> we're still trying to activate that, get that going, but it's a great building. The Center for Academic Medicine was built during shelter in place, and this is on Quarry Road. 
And I don't know if you've seen this as you've passed this, is for clinical educators. Uh, it faces the Arboretum, uh, same uh, kit of parts interpreted yet a different way. But some of the settings here, look at the, look at the um, upper right-hand corner, the view from that terrace overlooking the Arboretum is just spectacular. And sitting in the courtyard, uh, whether you went there for grand rounds or whether you're there for the cafe, your connection to, to biophilia and your connection to uh, the Arboretum is really, really important after being perhaps in the hospital for a good part of the day. And we're also working on a new project 1215 Welch Road will will be um, a research building that brings together different research. Uh, I think it focuses mostly on immunology. Um, this building is, I think it's about 200,000 square feet. Or we're trying to find a way to design labs so that there's more natural light, more places for write-up, um, and the more support. Um, and again, this what this will do is extend discovery walk to campus drive and so this is the site where all those modular buildings the one-story wood structures were with little decks and those have been taken away and and this will replace that and you can see again um, the palette of the uh, kit of parts as dean minor mentioned um, there's a formidable now center of school of medicine at the stanford research park um, this is right at porter drive and page mill road uh, repurposing of existing buildings, one being the old Theranos building, so that was a pretty new building, um, but uh, trying to find best ways to make community even in this location, which is a little less, you know, a little less about being on a campus and a little more about being in a research park. Some of you may have, haven't been to campus for a while, may have come in the front door of this building and looked behind you and said, what is that? What building is that? And so this is uh, the ChemH Neurosciences building. It's really conceived of as a complex of two buildings. And it's meant to be a magnet. And as Dean Miner said, it really brings together medicine, engineering, um, data science, information science. And um, it loosely, also transitions architecturally to the science and engineering quad because it's got hip to clay tile roof, but it also has a lot of similarities to the architecture of the School of Medicine. Now, Discovery Walk, you can see in the red dash line, went through the Clark Center portals, hits Campus Drive at the arrow, and kind of stopped there for a while and what's important is again making these connections for these multiple disciplines and so we do have a long-range vision for the biology basic science chemistry computer science data science area um, and it was important when we designed the bass biology building that we allowed discovery walk to move through it to that future commons um, and the two buildings that really anchored that future commons, the Bass Biology, and of course, Jennifer mentioned the um, old chemistry building that is now the SAP Center. Could do a whole presentation on this building because it was fascinating. We gutted it, it was four floors from basement to the roof. There was nothing inside this except for the four walls. Um, but we did look at the, the attributes that made it such a historic resource and this Laboratory, the volumes of space, the beautiful windows now serve as teaching labs for biology and chemistry. If I'm standing on the left hand image, I'm standing actually in the portal of the Clark Center, looking over to the Bass Biology Building across Campus Drive. You can see that portal. Uh, there's a media mesh installation, which is part of that bridge. And those are images that are derived from biology research. And I, I think as a, anybody could walk up and actually modify those a bit. But they add a little bit of color. They add a little bit of excitement um, and also invite you to move through. Um, and the large covered trellis over the courtyard um, is made of components that have the same color range as our sand, our, our uh, terracotta. Um, clay tile roofs. So again, using contemporary architecture, but the palette helps tie it together. And then a new building, if anybody um, took any classes in Heron Hall or Heron Labs, the biolo former biology building, this is 
on that site. This is a new data science and computation center that is just starting construction. Just want to mention arts on campus. I wish I could take this course. This is a course taught in the School of Medicine. Um, the relationship of the Rodin sculptures and the hands to modern health. And I, th I think this is a course that's been around for a while. I don't know if it's taught every year. Uh, but it really ties students to more than just you know, books and, and, and applications. It takes them into the art world as well. Uh, the Clark Center, you can even imagine going to a performance. Um, again, infusing and, and making well-rounded students is really important for that. Uh, in terms of the arts on campus, the, uh, the Bing Concert Hall has been a really important building. The Anderson Collection uh, was built specifically for the collection donated by the Anderson uh, family. Um, and what I liked about this building is that it can be contemporary, but it ties into the very original museum by use of the, the color materials, the scale, um, but it truly is a contemporary building because of what's inside of it. The McMurtry Art Building, probably the most out there, wilder building, a little more sculptural, um, but it does tie into the addition of the Cantor Arts Center. Uh, this was the hardest building I had to ever get through the Board of Trustees approval process and took quite a bit of effort um, and did change it a bit to, to make it more comfortable for them. But it, at its essence, it's down and dirty, concrete floors, it's not precious. It's very easy um, to see yourself as an art student there in the large natural lit galleries. Then of course, the Frost Amphitheater uh, renovation, I get completed almost right before the pandemic. They had a couple of stellar concerts in there and then they had to close it down. Um, but by adding the stage, you see in the upper right hand corner, it's making that venue a lot more accessible. Um, and it's great for alternative you know, events, um, you know, so people can come in a healthy environment, watch a concert. Um, it's not necessarily that you always have to go out to a drinking party on a Friday or Saturday night. One of my favorite projects, this one wins the award for taking the longest to come to fruition, believe it or not. Um, and, you know, I, I probably lost all my hair over this project as well or during it. But this, this hit a tipping point um, when I think we realize the importance of mental health as it relates to our students, staff, and faculty. And so this is a building that was designed around art as a collection by Nate Oliveira, who actually uh, was a faculty member here. But it really intentionally is a place for a student, a faculty member, or even staff to get away, to decompress, to meditate, uh, to contemplate, um, get away from that roommate that just is driving you nuts and it really becomes a quiet uh, place of respite. Crafting memorable spaces, always important. Um, for many of you, you may have remembered the, the winged lions. Some have called them the griffins. Uh, these were uh, flanking the entrance to the old convalescent hospital. They went over to Encina Gym probably 50 years ago. They went into storage when that building was torn down. We recently restored those, reinstalled these. These are the gateway to the mausoleum um, in the Arboretum. Making memorable places. Here's an example similar to the SEQ. Uh, this was where I used to have my first office. It's uh, surrounded by 900 parking spaces in the asphalt. Uh, and this transformed into the Knight Management Center for the School of Business, vibrant place buzz. We've really focused hard on placemaking. Uh, there's some great art if you haven't seen it in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, the Stanford Law School, uh, yet again a different way to interpret Stanford architecture. Um, and they wanted to make sure, as we do, that we had a variety of types of spaces. So a civic plaza at their entry, um, a more vibrant collaborative place in Crocker Garden, tables and chairs and umbrellas and food, and then the quieter place on the second level courtyard in the newer Newcomb building. It gives them the variety and you can tailor what you're doing to the space that you want to go to. Denning House uh, is for our Knight Hennessy Scholars. 
And this, this is an example of a very interdisciplinary effort. Uh, there are med students that are part of this program. This is at the end of Lamita Mall, right at Lake Laganita, or Laganita, and really was meant to tie and anchor itself into the landscape, be more natural, um, be of the scale of that area of campus. Um, again, I can't get into the fourth floor of this building where the students are, and I can't get into this building to give a tour, <laughs> tour because it's, it's, it's locked up. But um, I was talking earlier about Meyer Library. If any of you remembered Meyer Library, um, we had to take that down because of seismic concerns. We couldn't, we couldn't restore it. Um, and so as a temporary measure, we, we worked with the provost and ended up with sort of a half bowl so we didn't fill the whole basement up, but we also didn't leave it a hole. And this has turned into the magnet for students. They love and gravitate to this place. This is a, a photograph of NSO, uh, first day of campus, get to know your fellow colleagues or students. Um, but they also have impromptu performances and uh, events here as well. And on the edge of Meyer Green, we have a new program if you're interested in art. We call it the plinth program, where every two years there will be a new piece of art that is installed. Um, this is similar to what they do in Trafalgar Square. This piece was just installed about three or four months ago. Also adjacent to Meyer Green is our new project for the Graduate School of Education. They, they're sort of the last school that didn't get a whole lot. And so this is a chance for them to pull all of their, their um, the people from the school together uh, create a courtyard that they can call their own, hold events, and um, they will restore their original building, the School of Education building where Cumberly Auditorium was, but they will also um, be able to build a new addition to complement that. And the central courtyard and the idea of opening up a forum really allows them to highlight how they bring policy and practice together. Um, a lot of people think the School of Education is about teaching teachers. They actually do a lot of work in policy to make sure that good things are happening in the world um, in the school systems. We're also looking at the town center, the campus center today, to revitalize it. It certainly needs a lot of help. Um, We've done a lot of upfront programming. We want to make sure it's a place for cultural engagement, for intellectual exchange of ideas, a place to have safe and healthy social life, as well as deals with your daily life. I've got to go buy something at the CVS or get my hair. Well, I can't get my hair cut there, but um, I keep bringing that up. Uh, but this will be a place that I think we can intentionally make a lot more useful and exciting for students, faculty, and staff. Um, if you haven't ever visited, we have a whole other campus in Stanford Redwood City. Uh, this is primarily an administrative campus. You may note that a lot of the detailing is somewhat similar to what we have on main campus in our newer buildings. This is intentional. This is the Board of Trustees saying this campus is important. It's going to house a lot of Stanford people. Um, we want the quality to be as high or, or even better than we have on our main campus. Um, and there's a fabulous recreation center, there's a child care facility, there's a dining pavilion, all that helps support that, that campus. Residential life, a big part of Olmsted was making sure students and faculty lived together and, and lived on campus. Um, and it's not just about building dorms, it's about also supporting um, whether it's recreation or just casual student spaces or even providing areas for them to grow food next to their dorm. It's a really important part of, of the Stanford, um, Stanford culture. Now, many of you may have noticed the really, really big tall buildings coming on the east side of campus. This is Escondido Village. Um, this was a great opportunity where um, we could bring a lot more of the graduate students to campus to live. It's sustainable. It helps loosen up housing in the local communities for others. Uh, we built 2,400 new units, new beds, um, in this complex. And, you know, it's, it's really, we probably won't go that dense everywhere on campus forever, but I think it really proved that we, we need to go higher. We need to, to, to create more density in certain areas 
so that we can um, be good stewards and house our students. I think currently we guarantee four years for undergrads, um, for all undergrad students on campus. We house 60 to 70 percent of grads, which is phenomenal for a, a, a university this size, and upwards to 50 percent of our faculty. So when you compare us across the board, um, we really are a residential college. It takes a lot to maintain and steward the historic resources. Just wanted to mention that we're continually doing it. This is like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. We're continually working on the main quad. Upper left-hand corner is a recent mock-up of restoring the wood ceilings that just over time have lost their luster, lost their quality. Um, but we've replaced urns and bal balustrades and stained glass windows, um, to name a few things. But I, I really wanted to end on where are we going and what is our, what is our future? So this is the campus plan um, today, uh, Campus Drive and the red dash line. I don't, don't expect you to really read that, uh, but we saw this before that most of our expansion is going to be eventually in the west side of campus. Those blue boxes are um, not necessarily anything we know what's going in there, but they're designed to be consistent with the framework of the Olmsted plan. Helps me because when it's time to locate a new building or school, I know how to locate that within the framework or when we lay new infrastructure we are laying it in the right place uh, pipes and electric and voltage um, one of the more exciting initiatives on the main campus right now is is the new school uh, it'll start this fall it's a new school focused on climate and sustainability um, earth science the school of earth science will, will meld into this school and one of the things that's really important is it, it, it we don't envision this, envision this as one building sitting somewhere. This has got to be pervasive throughout campus. So we're going to create what we call a sustainability promenade, similar to almost like the High Line, if you've ever been to the High Line in New York City, where it connects different types of experiences, highlights, um, and can tell the story of what the school is going to be doing for the world. And as was mentioned before, this whole side of campus is spirited with sustainable program. This is Automotive Innovation Center. They, they study human mobility, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles, cars, planes, helicopters. We have an O'Donohue family Stanford uh, educational farm. Primarily it's used to teach students how to grow sustainable crops and how to translate that to the rest of the world. But what's really happened here is it's become a magnet for everything student focused. There are yoga classes, there are meditation classes, there are poetry readings, people go there for um, important meetings. Um, and you can even win a Be Well Berry by pulling weeds. So if you wanna get some healthy uh, activities going, they let you pull weeds for free. Um, but the biggest transformation has been what we've been working on over the last five to 10 years, and that's our SESI program. It's a Stanford Energy Systems Innovations. Um, and we, we were cutting edge in the 80s by building a cogeneration plant, but unfortunately, we had to replace it, and it ran on fossil fuel. So we went to a different system. We replaced 22 miles of steam pipes with hot water pipes. We converted 155 plus or minus buildings to accept hot water versus steam, built a central energy facility, and recently, two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, dedicated our second solar generation um, station. Um, and so if you look at these metrics, they're, they're unmatched actually in the country right now. Um, we are now able to say that Stanford University is run on 100% renewable electricity, which, which is an incredible statistic. We actually at some times make more than we need. Um, and we are able to say that we've reduced our greenhouse gases by 80% um, from our peak loads um, in 2011. We re reduced potable water by just eliminating the majority of our cooling towers by 18%. Uh, we are now looking closely at targeting zero waste by 2030, 
and also looking very closely at scope three um, emissions, which deal with like air, air flight and how people get to work and all the carbon that's produced by those things, embodied carbon in your buildings. But we have, we have been a platinum campus now for four years. That means you're the best of the best in terms of your sustainability program. And this isn't just a, a central plant, it's really a facility. And it's a place to gather, a place to learn. We've hosted over 5,000 tours to municipalities, to other countries, to the government, to make sure they understand how we did this. How did we reduce our greenhouse gases by 80%? Um, but one of my favorite shots is the photo in the upper right-hand corner sent to me by a graduate student um, the juxtaposition of, of what was there before, which was Governor Stanford's trotting fields, and our ability to reduce our greenhouse gases by 80% is so poetic in my mind. And, and it's a really important, that important juxtaposition, you know, that, that tension that we've talked about between Governor Stanford and, and Olmsted, where I think if either of them had gone on their own paths, we would have either ended up with a school in the foothills hidden by the trees, or we would have ended up with this monumental um, monstrosity down on the, on the plain. I think they both worked together um, as much as they could to create something that was wonderful. And, and Stanford really is about this tension now, right? I mean, the humanities and engineering and, and medicine, and it's how they complement each other that makes our university so successful. So that's... That was my roller coaster ride. Um, you know, at our at our um, our mantra is that we're caretakers of a legacy, uh, land, buildings, and real estate. And what that means to me is that there's a culture and, and there's there's this expectation and, and and sort of this wonderful part of Stanford that our buildings and planning support. It's I'm the legacy say. is not the buildings and plannings. The legacy is really um, what we're trying to support um, academically and research and residentially. So thank you. We're going to have a couple of questions and answers here. I, I'm going to call on uh, Dr. Prolo over here who has his hand up, but before I do, I, I want to recognize him as having, when the anatomy building, which many of you were familiar with, it was behind the old chem building and now the SAP Center, when it was demolished, Don and his family salvaged many of the bricks from that anatomy building. And uh, he and the uh, Alumni Association and um, a lovely uh, um, designer named Lauren Toomer um, actually uh, spent, we spent eight years on that project, right? And um, over in the CSSR building, in, um, there is a contemplative um, area with a beautiful sculpture using some of the bricks from that anatomy building. And it's there that the um, programs for the anatomy class, at the end of it, every quarter, they um, have a, a, a little service for the people who have donated their remains for that class. And it is a very wonderful uh, garden. And I encourage you guys to walk around and, and find that. Um, but it was really kind of the foresight of Don and his family and Lauren Toomer and the, um, the campus buildings and the fact that we do have gardens and places where we can enjoy. So I hope I didn't take your wind out of your sails, Don. Here's your question. <laughs> this was an outstanding presentation. Oh, thank I really you. loved it and appreciate it. I have three quick questions. One is the Eating Club building. Yes. Uh, we love that Eating Club experience adjacent to Toyon and across from uh, Encina. That's my first question. The second was, um, will they ever put water in Lake Lagunita again, the university? And the third question is, what's gonna happen to the Edward Durrell Stone building and the adjacent office building? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take your first question. The eating clubs, um, unfortunately, are gone. Um, if you've driven by, they're now a new uh, dormitory. Um, and I, I think they, they transferred the idea of the eating clubs to a different location on campus. Um, and I'm not sure really what happened with that. That's really residential and dining enterprises programmatically. 
Um, what we are doing right now is um, envisioning doing a different type of undergraduate residential neighborhood. Um, and I think that part of that will be how, uh, similar to some of the things that the eating clubs did well, and that's create community. Um, and uh, I think more on that's coming, but the idea was that a student, instead of getting jerked around campus because of the draw, the lottery, you would be assigned to a neighborhood and you could stay there for four years and, and maintain your friendships, develop your networks, uh, maintain your relationships with your resident fellows, um, enhance the, the culture with programming. Um, and so I think that is part of what we learned a little bit from what happened at the eating clubs, but those, those have been gone for probably eight years, I think. Lagunita, um, it leaks like a sieve. It, um, we can't keep the water in there long enough before it goes right down through. You'd have to restore the whole bowl. But more importantly, it, we, there's a 50-year easement, probably more like 45 now, from the county because it's habitat. It's the tiger salamander area, and we aren't really able to do a whole lot. We do put water in there when it's breeding season and they need to breed, and we haven't had rain. Uh, but it, it really doesn't hold water anymore. Uh, there's probably some underlying risk in the university. I don't know about, it's probably above my pay grade as well with that. Um, and the third question was the uh, stone complex. Um, stone complex is slated to be demolished. We're, we are working, been working over the last 15 years to figure out how to um, build new facilities or relocate the research and or the medical, um, the, you know, the patient beds, the other things that are in that facility. Uh, and, and a couple of reasons. One is that it's floor to floor height, meaning the floor to the next floor is only 10 feet, which means it's really hard to adapt it to anything that is about, you know, state of the art patient care or state of the art research. Um, and there's also some seismic things that just aren't sustainable long term for that building. Hello. Uh, yeah, it's always been sort of folklore in my mind of what Stanford Ranch really is. Uh, you know, we understand what the campus is, but in terms of how much land does Stanford really have with, uh, within this area? I mean, I know, for example, there's the shopping center, which is, you know, part of the original farm. Uh, how far does it go out? And what, yep, what is the extent of the acreage that actually Stanford has control over? Yeah, so um, Stanford, the founding grants 8,180 acres. The main campus is probably 25% of that. So the foothills all on the other side of, of I-280, Stanford land, um, most of it's leased for agriculture. Um, Jasper Ridge Preserve is up there. The entire Stanford Research Park is Stanford land. Um, we're not allowed to sell it. Well, we can ground lease it. We can, we can ground lease um, a site to a company, which means they pay a lot of money. It goes in to support scholarships. Um, and they have the right to use that for whatever the period of time is, 25 to 50 years. I think it's more like 25 now. Um, and then on the other side, it's the, the hospitals as well as uh, the Stanford Shopping Center. And that's primarily the 8,180 acres. We are not, by jurisdiction, allowed to build hardly anything in the foothills. Um, and so we use it, we manage it well. Uh, right now it's being used for recreation for the dish and for, ag as I said, for agriculture and leasing and research purposes. But we have a, we can build a couple of thousand square feet in all those vast acres. Um, we're actually in seven different jurisdictions, which also complicates things. and. Um, you have to really be careful about where you do what. We, we have a plot, I think it's probably been in the news a lot, in Portola where we're proposing to build some homes. And um, I think that's primarily the, how the 8,000 acres is made up. We also have the campus in Redwood City, a campus at Hopkins Marine, um, and then other campuses around the world are more leased. David, quick question. I'm curious about the, the solar panel installation and, and uh, 
that's the Stanford did that on on, on its own. Uh, is made here at the university or is partnered with a company? Do they have a storage solutions for that? The so-called gigapacks or you know the modern solutions to storage? Can you create energy and sell it or re, you know all those? You know that's the future. So I'm curious about the initiatives there. Yeah. So the um, good question. The the second. First of all, we, we, we were very, very fortunate in finding a window of time where we were allowed to buy direct access electricity, this power. This is about five or six years ago. It means we are part of a, a system that can buy directly off the grid and not from PG&E, which allows us to dial up or dial down our greenness of our, of our power. That's number one. The solar generating stations, um, and our solar panels we have on campus are primarily leases and agreements through companies that allow us to use the electricity. It, it literally goes back to, you know, the, what are the photons or whatever they are, go back into the grid wherever this is located. But we have also, in this last solar generation station, done batteries. So we are able to produce the energy, um, and maybe we don't push it back in the grid until later because what's happening in California is with all the solar power now, um, there's an excess amount of solar power during the day and not enough for night. So the batteries help to smooth that equation out a bit. Uh, the entire complex um, that we just dedicated is owned by Goldman Sachs. We, we are part of I think five or six major primary owners of our plots of of uh, panels. I think this will have to be our last question. How does managing uh, risk of uh, earthquake figure into your planning? Good question. Um, and now it's not just earthquake, it's also pandemic, and it's also wildfires, and it's also a lot of other things. But specifically for earthquakes, what we found um, in 1989, if you looked at a map of our buildings, we had a lot of red buildings. We have green buildings, which are, they meet and exceed code. We have yellow buildings that are pretty close, and we have red buildings that are not good. Uh, and so after 1989, that map was very red. And so we have spent the last, what, 30 years getting all the red buildings up to yellow or green, um, which we've done. And so we have a seismic advisory committee. Every new building that comes online is reviewed for um, seismic. Uh, we have higher classifications than the code requires. Uh, we make decisions whether or not, um, so all our emergency operation centers, our data centers have to be class one, meaning even after a major earthquake, they're operational. Class two for us, I think, means um, little damage, and it might take a little bit to get the building back into operations, but not significant damage. Class three means everybody can get out safely, but there might be a little more damage. Um, and class four means everybody can get out safely, but there's probably damage you're going to have to spend a little more time on. We evaluate every building. Um, as we look right now at buildings that we may want to decommission, um, we first look at seismic and say, what's its seismic quality right now? And what's interesting about it, it's dynamic it changes. So the, when the code actually gets more stringent, our expectations are we get more stringent, and so the building that might have been yellow um, 10 years ago is now down into the um, almost red zone, and we have to upgrade it. Um, we, we are spending more on residential now to make sure that it's not just about getting out safely, it's about being able to use them right after a major incident uh, if we have to house people. Okay, I want to thank Dave. I think this was a fascinating. I, I know it's very different from you know the, the morning presentations where it's a lot about um, medicine and research and everything, but I know that you're all connected to Stanford in many ways, and I think the campus itself is something that we all hold dear to our heart, and I really appreciate the stewardship that Dave has brought 
to the university and all the buildings that he's overseen. And just seeing that in all of presentation, I think was very impactful. So thank you for today and thank you for the, the work you do to preserve the legacy. Thank you. Thank you.